No. Okay, so we are going to formally start. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, good morning, good evening to all of you who come from different parts of the world and different continents in the globe. We are always delighted to have you um, for taking the time and making the sacrifice. Um, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic is still with us, still raging. Um, the safest place to be is home. Right if necessary. Okay. So we are going to formally start to welcome ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they, they know there's an echo there, right? Um, but wherever, wherever you are, wash your hands regularly and sanitize your environment in public places. Please keep your social distance and wear your face mask. I think it should be mandatory by law that everybody wear face mask in public. It is so in Trinidad, but not, not in other countries. The United Nations has dedicated today as the International Day of the Girl Child. We wish to recognize all the girls and women in this Zoom forum and, do, and, and others on the planet. For too long, their voices have been silenced in households, in schools, and public spaces. In Trinidad, we wish to recognize the three top winners in the nationwide secondary entrance assessment exam, the SEA exam, and they are all, all girls. They are Amira Biku of San Fernando TML Muslim Primary School, and Jana Dan of Trinidad Renaissance Prep, which has Sanskrit as one of the core subjects, and Sushmita Ramsawak of Gandhi Memorial Vedic School. In Guyana, we wish to congratulate Crystal Dundas of the Prestige School. It's a private secondary school called Saraswati Vidya Nikitan. Also, the school is also known as Swami School. It is located in Cornelia Ida, West Coast de Marara. And in Suriname, we wish to congratulate the top students of the common primary education exam, Yuvraj Bihari, uh, Bihari Singh, Sira Marhe and Sarian Joku. In recognition of this date today, we featured two women and two men as speakers. And our moderator tonight is also a woman. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center Company Limited, a legally registered research and publishing company operating since 2010. We are dedicated to highlighting and discussing issues and events that impact mainly Indo-Caribbean people in the region. We believe that they and their views are often marginal or marginalized in the mainstream media and in formal discourses and in public groups, organizations and institutions. The topic of these discussions are mainly on or about Indians, but these meetings are not for Indians only. It is open to all, regardless of ethnicity. This forum follows the Black Lives Matter movement, whose mission is to eradicate inequality, injustice, discrimination, and systemic racism. This forum is international in scope, it seeks to provide voice and visibility to a group that is an ethnic minority in the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, this public meeting will take the form of a panel presentation. Each speaker will talk for 10 minutes. In the first instance, followed by a Q&A. And after all of the speakers have spoken, the floor will be open for brief questions, comments, and contributions. The meeting would end about 9 p.m., which means it's going to take about an hour and a half. Please mute your microphone unless you have to speak. The microphone icon uh, or symbol is at the bottom left corner of your screen. For legal purposes, to avoid possible lawsuits of slander and defamation, we hereby state that the views expressed by presenters and participants are their own and do not necessarily represent those of 
Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. Our moderator tonight is new in her role, but not new to this forum. She is Dr. Kirti Algu from Suriname. She will rotate with moderators Charlene Maharaj and Sadhana Mohan whenever they are available. Everyone here, including me, has been volunteering as a form of community service. Dr. Kirti Algu is a young graduate of Anton de Com University of Suriname, where she works as a researcher in the Institute of Graduate Studies and Research. She obtained her PhD, having done her dissertation on interreligious relations in Suriname and Guyana in 2017. Currently, Kirti is combining sports, specifically martial arts, with her academic career. Dr. Kirti Algu, welcome and please take over from here. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahabi, for providing me with this opportunity and platform. Our topic tonight is divided into two parts. First, the 2020-21 national budgets in Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname in relation to oil and gas revenues. And second, the budget's impact on the Indo-Caribbean community in the respective countries. In Trinidad and Tobago, the national budget was read in Parliament on Monday. In Guyana, the national budget was presented in the National Assembly about one month ago on September the 9th. In Suriname, the national budget was read in the National Assembly two weeks ago on September the 29th. In all three countries, the budgets were presented in the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic and based largely on expected oil and gas revenues. Citizens, analysts, and stakeholders have been paying close attention to see what would be the government's plans for the respective countries. Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname are multiracial or multi-ethnic countries in which there is rivalry, competition, tension, and even conflict among ethnic groups. It is therefore logical and legitimate to critically examine the expected impact of the budget on the economic sectors in which Indians or Hindustanis dominate. No analyst has taken an ethnic approach in reviewing the budget. Dr. Mahabi has observed that budgets have been studied to determine their impact on youths and women, but why ignore race or ethnicity? Is it a taboo topic to be discussed only behind closed doors? Is race or ethnicity not an aspect of human de demographics such as age and class? To refuse to discuss race or ethnicity in an objective, respectful, dispassionate, scientific, and intellectual manner is like refusing to see the elephant in the room. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for me to bring our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Indira Sajewan, a renewed economist in Trinidad and Tobago with over 25 years in the field, having served as a lecturer in economics. She is also a policy analyst, an evaluator and consultant. She was a senator in a member of parliament. Dr. Sajewan is a specialist economic consultant in competitiveness, clusters and value chains and was executive director of the Caribbean Center for Competitiveness. She is the current executive director of the Caribbean Competitiveness Foundation. Dr. Sajewan, the microphone is yours for 10 minutes. Everyone else, please mute his or her microphone. Thank you very much. Let me start by, um, you know, by, uh, saying thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to this forum to share my, my, my thoughts on the Trinidad and Tobago budget 2021. And it is true to say that in my analyses, I, I, I have not in the past um, taken an ethnic view of, of the analysis in, in simply really just looking at it in terms of how it impacts and impacts um, people's lives in general. Um, so it is very interesting for me to look at look at the data, look what look at what has presented, and just really 
seek to make those kinds of connection, which I would I would try to do very briefly in this 10 minute introduction. Let me start by saying that as in all of the countries, budget 2021 comes at a very difficult time in all our country's history. The COVID pandemic has really wreaked havoc on our economies, businesses have closed, unemployment is an alt at an all time high. Our budget is anticipating negative growth of 6.8% in 2020. It is projecting that because of COVID, our debt to GDP ratio has moved from 65% to now 83%. And with this budget and the anticipated borrowing, it will obviously increase even further. But my position is it is not a time for us to worry about deficits because the imperatives for protecting lives and livelihood is, is, comes with COVID and therefore this should be the objective. The budget speaks to two objectives according to the Minister of Finance. One, to stimulate economic activity and two, to provide financial assistance to individuals and businesses. So that in looking at the budget, I will try as best as I can to identify those things and speak to how they impact in this instance, particularly the Indo-Trinidadian community. So in terms of stimulating the economy, we can look at it from the demand side and we can look at it from the supply side. From the demand side, the, econ the, the, the budget has provided some initiative that will in fact stimulate demand because it is very, very important at this point in time that we stimulate the demand, the consumption of goods and services because without the increased consumption of goods and services, the economy will continue to slide and there will not be the incentive for production and for businesses to want to invest or want to expand or want to simply be, you know, provide their services. So on the demand side, there's some interesting um, initiatives. The first one is a, the income tax exemption has now moved from the first $72,000 to the first $84,000. Now, this is an initiative that benefits everyone. Although the Minister of Finance was at pains to mention that now anyone with an income of $7,000 per month and less will pay no income tax, which is in fact true. But insofar as everyone who is a paid employee who pays PAYE will now enjoy the benefit of having their first $84,000 tax exempt, it means that everyone benefit. And therefore all ethnicities, and in this instance, Indo-Trinidadians who are employees will obviously benefit from about an additional $3,000 of spending capacity per annum. There's a commitment in the budget to continue to provide salary grants until December 2020 to the creative industries. And as we all know, the Indian community is very involved in the creative industry. So, um, you know, Dr. Kumar um, would probably better be able to identify all the niche groups. But so this is a this is a benefit that is available. This income support, salary support until December 2020 to all individuals in the creative industries. So that would involve um, the Chutney singers, the you know the, those who are involved in Ram Leela, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge, of course, is accessing and the, the bureaucracy and the extent to which there is organization among the different groups in order to be able to access. That to me would be the challenge. Um, so those to me, in, in terms of simulating demand, are the, are, are the two critical elements that impact the community. On the other hand, there are a number, the, 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 the the minister speaks a lot about simulating acti economic activity from the supply side, and he identifies a number of sectors. Agriculture always gets mentioned in the budgets. This year, though, agriculture got uh, a, a, a really a large um, play in terms of the delivery. The minister started off in terms of economic stimulation, recognizing the importance of food security. Unfortunately, it would appear that our Minister of Finance suddenly woke up and realized how important agriculture and food security is, because this is the same minister that's been in power for the last five years, and basically the agriculture sector has continued to decline. And I speak to the agriculture sector particularly because it is one that is dominated by, by Indo-Trinidadian. Of course, by and large, our farmer community and even in agro-processing to a large extent, it is dominated by East Indians. So therefore the, the, the huge play on agriculture and the large emphasis on agriculture could obviously benefit this community. The minister, the only difference when it comes to budgetary allocation is that the minister is now proposing to provide an additional $500 million to the agriculture sector. 
what exactly he and how this money is to be dis dis disbursed within the sector is left to be seen. He has to identify a number of interesting areas that we should focus in on agriculture, things such as precision agriculture, marine aquaculture, vertical farming, livestock farming. So many of some of these are new to the lexicon of the budget delivery. So that, that is one important sector I think there could be benefit from. Secondly, the manufacturing sector. Now we have quite a number of East Indian businessmen who are involved in manufacturing. And therefore, the commitment in the budget to support the manufacturing sector and expanding the, the output or the contribution of the manufacturing sector from its current about 8% to 19% by 2024 is one that obviously, if there are initiatives put in place to support this, will obviously benefit the East Indian community. Um, the construction sector is another one that significant focus has been placed on. And again, this is a sector that there is a strong presence of the, of the Indo-Trinidadian community. And, and therefore, the, the, the incentives that are put in place, particularly targeting small contractors, where the state is committing to, um, to ensuring that 20% of housing construction is, um, is cordoned off to be made available to small and medium businesses. So that to the extent that you have um, Indo-Trinidadian contractors in this category, they stand to benefit from this. The minister intends to provide a $1 billion fund to the HDC for unlending for home construction, and that really should act in this fiscal year as, a, as, a, as an important stimulant. And there is a lot of provision in terms of um, starter homes, lower income homes, middle income homes, where the down payment is moved now from the traditional 10% to 5%, and where the attempt has, is being made to bring the repayment, the monthly repayment, as low as is possible. So this, while it does benefit everyone, to the extent, obviously, it would benefit um, Indo-Trinidadians. Now, obviously, the devil is always in the detail, and the devil is always with implementation. And that, unfortunately, continues to be a a major challenge with respect to budgets and in Trinidad and Tobago and government policy on the whole. So, so there are many, many initiatives in the budget that we have heard many, many times before. There are some particular ones that are obviously of concern. There is the anticipation that we are going to be faced with increased um, water rates, increased electricity rates. This obviously will cut into people's um, already tight budgeting process. So that is obviously going to affect us, the reintroduction of the property tax on residential um, um, properties in this fiscal year is one that will affect the East Indian community very, very strong because by and large, um, that this is a community that invests heavily in real estate, in property, in homes, and therefore they will definitely feel the burden of this new property tax that will be implemented. And this is a very difficult time for persons. We are seeing we are, the liberalization of, of um, the price of gas at the pump, which means that owners of vehicles will be will, will now be faced with maybe not in the immediate period because of the global situation and the low prices of gas but certainly once turnaround starts to happen the Trinidad and Tobago consuming market and again East Indians are play a very large part in terms of ownership of vehicles will will be will feel the brunt of increased prices. Obviously, there are challenges with respect to this initiative because it is being demonopolized or, or deregularized at the gas stations. However, we have a situation where the government will continue to control the wholesale price and will continue to operate a monopoly with respect to the importation of gas. In my view, that will not redound to, to, the, to the best interest of the, of the country. In addition to which, there's a plan to, and I think I, I will wrap up here now, there's a plan to um, to sell all the gas station, to privatize the gas station. So ownership now becomes key and ensuring that there's a mechanism that is transparent and accountable that allows everyone 
to be able to have access to this initiative. initiative. So, you know, and, 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 and let me just wrap up to say these, I think, are some of the initiatives that from the budget and that will impact particularly and directly on the Indo-Trinidadian community. Thank you, Dr. Indira Sajewan from Trinidad and Tobago. You were perfect on time. <laughs> Our second speaker, who is Mr. Dharwaj Singh, the founder and the executive director of the Guyana Budget and Policy Institute. He brings more than 10 years of experience in economic development, international cooperation, and public policy research. He leads the strategic direction of the Institute, acts as the primary spokesperson, and works with the board of directors and community partners to implement the mission and visions of the Institute. Prior to setting up the Budget Institute, then right Singh coordinated and managed the Caribbean Local Economic Development Program in Guyana and was part of the leadership team for the rest of the Caribbean. Mr. Singh, the floor is yours. Please speak for 10 minutes. Everyone else, they should mute his or her microphone. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Albu, and thank you, Dr. Kumar, for your invitation um, to the, poor, the forum. And, and Good evening to all of our listeners. Um, I, I would begin my, my presentation by saying, Dr. Albu, if at any point in time you see me heading over the time, please get, do, not be, be, do not withhold an, an interruption and say, hey, you know, watch the time. I tend to get lost of that sometimes. Um, let me start off first by talking about the first section of the question and the issue of the 2020 budget. Um, many of you would probably know that I cannot speak about the 2020 budget in Guyana without acknowledging the, the context and the, the circumstances in which this budget in and of itself was even conceptualized, formulated, and placed before the assembly. You all probably are aware that Guyana, unfortunately, have had to deal with five months of political um, and constitutional crisis from the March 2nd election right up to August the 2nd. And that is not including all the issues that predated that period starting from the, the no confidence motion that was tabled in the National Assembly back in late of 2018. So if, if, we, if we just look at a simple timeline, we had a new government that was installed in August the 2nd, which is almost half of the year would have already passed. And so the budget 2020 must be assessed. It must be, be, be talked about within that context. First, I'd like to mention is that it was just some highlights on the budget itself was the fact that it was presented in a very short time. I think it was less than 25 days, which is a record breaking time in which a budget was formulated and, and put before the assembly in the Adams history. And the priorities that the, the budget had to address, as, as my former colleague, the, the former speaker mentioned, is that you have, a historic, you have a historic pandemic that is still grappling these economies across the world, not just in Guyana and the Caribbean. And so you're coming out of a constitutional and political crisis. You have a historic pandemic to address. And in my own uh, analysis, the, the budget also had to take cognizance of five years of poor economic management under the previous administration that has led to some very systemic economic weaknesses over those period. So all of that paints the picture in the, that, that the new administration had to rush in, in, into government and, and quickly approach putting a budget together. So the budget of 320 billion Guyana dollars was passed recently. That is roughly about US $1.6 billion, about five times less Trinidad's budget, of course. Um, and inside of that budget, what, what I, when I look at it from a 55,000 view um, in the air, what it really did is a complete re reorientation of government priorities. And it's reflective of the new administration priorities going into government. And by that, I mean the budget return investments to people it, it, it returned appropriations that were 
taken away from sectors such as the agriculture sector and other key sectors and put monies back into those sectors. Um, and it also passed or includes a number of measures that really focus on putting more monies back in the hands of people. So give them more disposable income to spend. Um, recognizing that in this period of time, you need economic stimulus and it has to come from, from, from the household sector, which is the largest spending sector in the economy. Now, I'll come to some of those measures in a couple of minutes, but strictly speaking with respect to oil and gas sector and how this has been addressed in the budget, we have a natural resource ministry under which the purview of, of oil and oil resource management falls under. And in the budget, there's a $1.2 billion allocation for that ministry. And outside of that, within that $1.2 billion, about $450 million was allocated to deal with issues of regulation uh, and management of the petroleum industry. You, you know that we're still, we're still um, having discussions on a national local content policy. There are still some implementing legislation that needs to be put in place to make sure the government can make use of the, the revenues, the oil revenues that are sitting in the natural resource fund. And so all those are priorities that the new administration is yet left to iron out. But clearly there has been um, allocations made for those works to, 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 to happen. Um, it, I think it is important to mention that any government right now that is putting a budget in, in the heart of a pandemic like this, you have to borrow. You have to go and borrow with economic activities coming to a halt in many of these places, almost a precipitous fall when the, the lockdowns uh, and procedures were put in place, economic activity fall, revenues are gonna fall. But this is not the time for governments to back away. This is the time for them to invest. They gotta pick up the tap and keep these economies um, from falling to the, 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 their faces. And so in, in, in our situation, the government actually had to do that. And, and I think about 70 something billion dollars of the budget uh, was, was financed by borrowing. But what was interesting to me when I looked at the budget and the way it was put together and financed, I have to mention that of the $20 billion that we have sitting in, in the natural resource fund um, in the Federal Reserve in New York, none of that money was touched. And I think it's important to recognize that because the government has made very clear that it is not going to use oil revenues um, in, in a very piecemeal or patchwork way. It wants to make sure that all the systems, regulatory systems, transparency and accountability systems are in place before it taps into those funding. So I think what I think was skillfully and carefully done by the new administration is figuring out a way in how to at the same time adopt measures that puts more money into the hands of people in addition to appropriation and spending, and at the same time, be very careful to not fall into the prey of orally tapping into reserves in a very piecemeal way. Uh, and, and I think that is reflective in, in, this, in the budget speech where the government commits itself to the Santiago's principles, which you, as some of you would know, those are the gold standards in terms of policies and systems for managing oil resources. So, when it comes to those kinds of things, uh, the, the, the oil and gas and how it addresses to the budget, those are some of the things I'll mention. Um, in terms of pro growth projections, you know, our non-oil economy, Ghana in, in, in many regards has been blessed, although it is a late comer to the oil and gas sector. And I say it has been blessed because I think we had a diversified economy even before oil. All we need to do right now is to make sure we maintain and grow that diversification um, and not allow it to fall. And I think the government, the, the way the government has appropriated monies out of this budget is reflective of that. For example, they have return record um, funding to the agriculture sector, which was largely ignored by the past administration. Um, and also they have, they have returned monies to sectors, uh, industries such as the, the, the sugar industry, which again, the past administration has closed down. So they're maintaining a good focus, I believe, in terms of holding the diversified economy and not allowing it to slip into, into a more narrow and, and a, and a high-risk economy. The non-oil economy is projected to decline by 4%, which I think within the circumstances is remarkable because other economies are, are probably going to be hitting way more than 5% contraction, some even in double digits. Um, but that is reflective of the fact that, you know, even though we have lockdown procedures in Guyana, 
we are blessed again with space. Density is not so much as a, of an issue in Guyana. 750,000 people spread across, well, not totally across, but for a huge part of our 85,000 um, square miles. We don't have that level of density that we have to be so stringent in our lockdown procedures. You can still allow the economy to operate at a certain level um, while taking necessary precautions to save people. Um, so the non-oil economy is, is projected to decline by 4%, but overall, when you factor in the oil and gas sector, we're expected to grow about 40%, which again, based however you look at it would be good, and, 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 and you can also look at the shortcomings of that. Now, let me switch to the second part of, of the presentation, which focused on the more sort of um, focus on how the budget and its measures are going to address the challenges for the Indo community. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, that, you know, Guyana, we're, we're a country of six races. And I personally has never seen in the past, in the budget that I've looked at, where governments necessarily take uh, measures or policies that are specifically geared to one particular race. It has always been about lifting the masses and making sure that everybody gets a fair shot. Um, I'm not sure I can say that the same for the last administration, and I'll defend that position in a minute. But at certainly in, with the new administration, a series of, for example, um, tax and revenue measures have been taken that I think is going to bring immense benefits to, to the Indo community. Um, for example, there is a removal of, of VAT on electricity, the, the, the consumption tax, really, the value added tax on electricity and water. And certainly, our population out of 750,000 people, about 45% of those are Indo Guyanese. And so you can imagine already this is about half of the economy that this, these two measures alone, and those are just two out of about 100 different measures of similar nature that is going to return more monies, disposable income into the hands of these families. Um, I mentioned earlier about the agriculture sector. In the last five years under the past administration, they have consistently neglected needed funding for the agriculture sector. And my own analysis, and I'm gonna own this, is that it was political in nature, and that is because the agriculture sector largely is dominated by indo guyanese And the past administration has always felt for some reason or the other, or for, for statistics, whatever, the evidence is there that most of their supporters are not, not indo guyanese And so in my mind, that was a political decision. Um, OK, Mr. Singh, I, I need you to wrap up. OK. Have 10 minutes. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and so this government returned a lot of funding into the agriculture sector. And perhaps the, the icon of that decision is to reopen some of the agriculture in estates that were closed by the past government. And again, the thinking is along the same line. Although employment in the, in the sugar industry um, benefits all races, the majority of the, 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 the beneficiaries or the workers in the industry are in Guyanese. And so these shutdown were reversed, the government reopening these industries and are pumping money to bring back the sector to some level of vitality. Um, there are other measures, for example, in, agric in an agriculture development area called the MMA, Maika, Maikoni, and Abari, uh, Abari agriculture area, where the past governments increased rates massively for, for rental and leasing of lands. And again, so many of those measures, this current administration ruled back. You know, I can go on and name several more of these measures, but the bigger picture that I want you to get here is that at least when it comes to tax and immediate finance measures, this government really put a package together that could put back into the hands of almost every single guy in his family, about 50, north of anywhere between 50,000 Guyana dollars to 200,000 Guyana dollars over, the, over a year period. And within the circumstances, I think that is remarkable. I'm sure questions are gonna come up and I'll be happy to address them. I, I apologize for going over on the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dharaj Singh of Guyana. Our second to last speaker is Dr. Stephen Debbie Prasad. He is a medical doctor who studied medicine at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He has an MSc degree in macroeconomic analysis and policy and teaches economics at the Andandakam University of Suriname. Since 2014, he has been a board member of the Association of Economists in Suriname. He has close affiliations with the Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance in Suriname. 
Dr. Devi Prasad, please speak for 10 minutes. Um, thank you, Kirti. Uh, dear par participants, I'm honored to speak to, to you today from a Surinamese point of view on a topic acknowledging that we don't have an oil and gas industry like, uh, Guy like uh, Guyana at, at the moment. We have a small um, um, oil, uh, oil uh, uh, company starts only, but it isn't com comparable with uh, the activities in Trinidad. So two quick notes before I start. Our economic data doesn't distinguish between ethnicities and economic uh, policy. Especially in the last decade, there was no uh, ethnic focus in policy. Before I come to the budget, I have to clarify that our economic structure is, more, is no more comparable with Latin America, with populismo being an important ideology of some political parties. This has brought us on a similar path as uh, Venezuela and maybe Argentina and Ecuador. Okay, so Suriname is at an important crossroad. We can leave behind a fraught past and, or go forward on a, on a path of improvement and growth. The stability of government finances has been seriously undermined, mostly in the run-up to the elections of May of this year. Government spending became unsustainable with large government deficits in 2019 and 2020, and it looks like it's continuing in 2021. The government deficit for 2020 was estimated at 17.8% of GDP, which is huge, while the budget for 2021, as presented uh, in September, um, will result in a similar deficit, but even higher, namely 19.7% of GDP. So it actually looks like we keep continuing on the same devastating path. Excessive monetary financing by the central bank uh, to help the government, to help the government out with, ex with its expenditure had severe consequences for the uh, Surinamese dollar. The consequences were uh, eventually several depreciations of the Surina Suriname dollar. Um, to give a, a number, the official exchange rate um, in the year 2011 was around 2.8 uh, SRDs for the US dollar. And since uh, September of this year, it's uh, 14 SRDs, you have to pay 14 SRDs for US dollar. And still we haven't uh, had, uh, um, for, uh, we, we don't have a, a stable foreign exchange market. The current position is that a central bank has a consolidated government debt of um, 8.5 billion SRDs um, with, um, with uh, an, an amount of monetary reserves of just 3.5 coverage, while the international norm is three-month import coverage. In order to be able to continue spending without closing the budget, one loan after another was taken out by the Surinamese government, not just locally, but especially abroad. The uh, legal ceiling of national debt, originally at 60% of GDP, has been breached since 2016 and, been adjusted and was adjusted each time uh, through legislation, uh, through parliament. As of June 2020, more than 120 loans have been booked by the National Debt Office, and the official debt is above 3 billion US dollars, which is approximately 1.4% uh, of our GDP. So definitely not sustainable. The government of Suriname has issued two international bonds since uh, 2016. The first one was in 2016. The second one was, in, uh, was at the end of 2019 with a combined amount of uh, 675 million US dollars and an interest rate of above 10%. Uh, this serious debt burden has become an issue this year since we're not able to make these payments and are constantly at the verge of default. Even managing current expenses of the government has been a major challenge as shown by Fitch ratings and several of their rating publications. Uh, we currently have a double C, uh, double C minus rating, which is really poor. Currently the Minister of Finance, the Ministry of Finance is unable to meet its debt obligations, especially the coupon payments of this month and December later this year. So that uh, rescheduling is, is inevitable. 
the expected economic growth for 2020 will be ar around minus 7.6 percent, uh, nearly the uh, the number of Trinidad, according to our planning office. Many workers have lost their jobs or part of their income. COVID-19 contributes to these bad numbers, but don't forget that largely these bad numbers are due to bad uh, um, management of government uh, budget, as mentioned before in the presentation. The most important task for the new government is not just closing the budget deficit, deficit but also doing so given the COVID-19 circumstances, severe economic contraction, and the high debt, had, um, high debt burden with a near uh, default credit rating. Seeking assistance from the International Monetary Fund is inevitable, even knowing that the IMF formula is one of strict austerity, further increasing social pressure on the population already severely impoverished by previous government policy. Ironically, the previous government implemented many social programs uh, to help all the, the, the population, but at the end, left many masses, left the masses, the masses uh, impoverished. So that's, that's the, uh, the outcome of, of populismo. At the end of the day, uh, the ones that you want to help out will, will be uh, worse off. The new government under President Santoki has been working on a plan to restructure the economy, beginning with monetary and fiscal principles. Um, the first step, uh, namely to unify the foreign exchange rate has already been done in September, um, and it didn't really go well. The second step was to increase gasoline prices. That this has already happened. Um, increase income on sales, on um, increase income taxes and sales taxes will follow shortly, uh, hitting uh, mostly the more wealthy according to the government. But increased sales taxes uh, before the end of this year will and increased electricity bill will surely affect most of the population. And um, so because of this topic, also in the studies. Although a few documents have been shared with uh, the Surinamese economists by the local government, we cannot say that what we've seen is a clear cut program, it's just a work in progress. Talks on a technical level have uh, already started with the IMF for a standby arrangement, but understand, understandably, without a clear cut plan, for restructuring of your economy, where you, you will not get IMF support. Fortunately, there is a bright horizon. Uh, there is a bright light at the horizon. I'm mainly talking about the offshore uh, oil discoveries in Naka, Sapakara, and the Waskwasi oil wells, all located in Block uh, 58 uh, with um, Apache Total as operator. So there are good prospects, but keep in mind, most of these pros prospects will only um, have uh, revenues uh, far later than five years. So for the time being, that's the second part of, of, of the, the topic of today. However, strict austerity measures are inevitable. Um, Suriname doesn't have figures on Hindustani's buy sector, but overall you could estimate, you could stipulate just like Diana, that this group is more active in trade and cultivation of agriculture goods. Um, also exports of these agriculture goods compared to other ethnicities. Especially in agriculture, these activities are seen as informal, resulting in little assistance from the government. Since austerity measures will result in price effects, less uh, social support to mitigate these effects is, expect, is expected for not formalized work and aka uh, ag agriculture work. So concluding, not just the lower income groups, uh, but also the ones involved in informal work, um, and that could def that could surely be Hindu studies, will uh, suffer in the following months and the following years because of the uh, austerity measures which are which are inevitable. All revenues, if any, um, shouldn't be expected within five years. So local productivity must be supported by the government uh, to get the economy back on track. Um, if you look at the current uh, budget, you don't, there, there is a COVID fund. Uh, it is uh, in an amount of 1.5 billion SRDs, which means um, one, uh, one, uh, 105 million US dollars, but it's more uh, for health assistance and assistance 
for um, the lower social classes. There isn't a, um, there isn't enough money set aside for the agriculture sector, although this sector has the most potential for the coming months, for the coming years, to help out the economy. Um, it is expected that um, all the um, all the all the programs that Suriname is working on, the standby arrangement with IMF and maybe uh, other arrangement with the IDB or the World Bank will definitely have um, loans to several sectors and especially loans to the agriculture, loans to the rice sector, but also the small crops which are um, cultivated for exports to the to, to the European Union, but also uh, Caribbean nations. But at the moment, we don't have uh, these plans. I haven't seen any of the clear-cut plans of the government to get definite um, financing from uh, multilateral institutions. So far now, um, it is definitely a, a, a quite a, a bleak time in Suriname's history. It's a bleak time for Surinamese, but also for uh, Hindustanis. Um, can you all of the wrap measures up? which have, yeah. Can you, can you please wrap up? Yeah. All of the measures which will definitely tackle most of the population will surely also uh, tackle Hindustanis, not just in Paramaribo, but also in several other parts of Suriname. Uh, okay, so on that note, I, I think that I can stop my presentation. I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephen de Lipesat of Suriname. Our final speaker is the discussant. She is Dr. Indira Rampasad, a lecturer of political science and international relations at UV in Trinidad. She was an election observer for the Organization of American States in Grenada, El Salvador, and Guyana. Her doctoral dissertation focused on American foreign policy to Cuba. Her research now extends to Latin America and Caribbean politics and international relations, American foreign policy, alternative energy, food security, and crime with specific emphasis on the Caribbean. Dr. Lampasad, the floor is yours. Speak for 10 minutes, please. Good evening. Are you waiting for me? Yes. yes. Sorry, I, sorry, I just got reconnecting. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, I should say. Um, and again, thanks to the organizers, including Dr. Mahabir, for inviting me once again to speak um, on an issue which is not my area of expertise per se, um, political scientists. Um, your, your, sorry, your video is off. Is that deliberate? Your no, video it's is not. Off. It's not deliberate. But when I put it on, I was not uh, seeing the, any any image, and okay. it will also impact the bandwidth. So uh, once All you right. can hear me properly, yes, I think yes. we should. Okay, yeah. fine, fine. Yeah. If you're okay with that. Yes, we're okay. All right. So um, I've been listening with interest to the uh, to the, the the three speakers on Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname. And what we identify is now that we are three oil and gas based economies, uh, which is a relatively new phenomenon, I think, for both Guyana and Suriname. Trinidad has been old in the business. So um, we, we want to see the extent to which that is going to impact. And I think the theme here is the Indo Caribbean community in terms of these three countries. Now, one of the things I want to point out before I go into that is that. Um, I recently came across something that was circulated on WhatsApp uh, showing the, these three countries, Guyana, Trinidad, and Tobago, with um, very high corruption index uh, in the Caribbean. So Guyana was third, Trinidad and Tobago was fourth, and Suriname was five, corruption index. So while we all have a three, uh, while we all have oil and gas-based economies now, we also all have corruption. And we also ha all have multi-ethnic populations with uh, huge Indo-Caribbean Indo populations. So uh, those are other commonalities between these three countries. Uh, we also note, uh, I've also noted from the speakers, the um, role of agriculture. And it's important for all three countries because it's primarily the Indo-Caribbean 
uh, population in these countries uh, that engage in agriculture production, and, and that is no secret. I don't think we need to prove that in any way. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, our 2020, 2021 budget um, allocated uh, $500 million to agriculture, um, something that was noted by Indira. Um, yes, Indira, the question I would like to ask is, would that be enough? Because I think the last government had allocated a lot more, but we are still in dire straits with regard to our food import bill. We have a, we have a massive food import bill still. Um, uh, the, the current administration have never paid enough attention to agriculture, and whether that was deliberate or not, uh, we will have to prove that. But uh, the point is that agriculture has suffered. And this, uh, the speaker from Suriname said the same thing. The speaker from Guyana said the last administration, the Granger regime, but the Granger administration did not pay enough attention to agriculture. So uh, it is heartening to see this government putting some money in there time we still have to see how it's going to be appropriated and who indeed will benefit whether it will be the indo trinidadian community or the indo surinamis in that case but the current administration in guyana my understanding is that they are they are taking this very seriously guyana has always had that uh, as one of its main states for revenue because remember guyana didn't have oil and gas in the past so guyana is way ahead uh trinidad and probably even Suriname with regard to agriculture. The other thing we want to note in common is uh, the issue of the, we have here the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, so the reserves. And we want to note that in Trinidad and Tobago, that reserve has declined or has been dipped into by this current government. The speaker from Guyana mentioned 20 billion in, uh, in New York reserve funds that have not been touched. And I wish we could say the same in Trinidad, but we have been dipping into that. And while we're boasting to some extent of an increase, um, we want to note that a lot of that increase is due to huge loans, huge borrowing from multilateral agencies. And some of you would recall the minister boasting about how much we could have borrowed in the last, in the mid-year review Of the budget when he said we are in a good place. So oh, it seems she has a problem with the connection. So we would um, have to reconnect with her. So go, go ahead, Kirti. Okay. With the QA. Yeah. Okay. She would probably reconnect. Yeah. All right. Um, Dr. Indira, if you hear us, thank you so much for your presentation. We know that you have a problem with the connection today, but thank you for your contribution. That was Dr. Indira Rambusarat of Trinidad and Tobago. We now move on to the QA session. The floor is now open for questions, comments, and contributions. Please note that they must be short, no more than two or three minutes. All the speakers will be given three or four minutes at the end of this meeting to respond to your active participation. Let's take all the questions and comments now, please. You can also participate by writing in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, which will be seen by everyone. Sorry, I'm, I'm back. Yes, can I continue? Yes, oh, yes. We... continue. Go okay. ahead. So I wouldn't be long. Um, what I want to touch on is the, um, we have a number of other issues that will impact everyone. And I agree policies are generally, budget policies are generally made nationally and, and not, um, not selectively in terms of particular ethnic groups. So it's very difficult to, uh, to do that kind of analysis. But um, we want to look at this freezing of public sector jobs. Because we talk about, uh, Indira, you talk about the um, income tax allowances for over 72,000 going to 84,000 and people under 7,000 per year. 
but we have about 100,000 people without jobs, so they don't even have a salary to be taxed, you know, and we have, and this is before COVID, eh? you know, we didn't crash with COVID. I would never agree that Trinidad and Tobago crashed with COVID. Before COVID, this country was in dire, dire economic straits. Um, so I think that COVID has exacerbated the problem, certainly, and COVID is also being used as an excuse for poor economic policies. I uh, also want to touch on the property tax. A lot of Indo Trinidadians will be affected, as Sandira pointed out, because they have property. Um, a lot of people are going to be impacted, and particularly the poor. The um, property tax doesn't mean that only rich people have property in Trinidad. A lot of poor people have land in Trinidad. And um, they have, they have the, the, the law itself, the property tax law. In the law, if you don't pay the tax, the government has the authority to seize your property. And this is a very, very dangerous move because we can see a lot of people, because we know there are a lot of Indo Trinidadians in South, um, with acres and acres of land, or unused land, and they uh, have to pay tax on that. That is going to be difficult. That is going to be very, very difficult. And don't talk about land in uh, North Trinidad, which price is very high. And the business sector, the Indo-Trinidadian business sector, are going to have to pay property tax, commercial property rates. Um, the other thing we want to note is that trade union settlements, and I speak now in my capacity as a trade union leader. I'm the president of the West Indian Group of University Teachers at UWE. I represent academic senior administration, administrative and professional staff at UWE. And we have not had settlements since 2014, and many other trade unions arrears have not been settled outstanding arrears since 2011, some since 2011, some since 2014. So we are living on 2011, 2014 salary. Um, yeah, we, we didn't hear anything on the budget on continuation of the OJT on the issue of gate. Students continue to pay very low fees, and I wonder if we can sustain that and whether we can even sustain the gate. Um, we heard criticisms about the building an ANR airport currently and the reduction in the police force, um, reduction in the allocation from 575 million to 334 million. Um, and then also this vaccine issue, I find it worrying Caribbean Airlines. And we privatize, we privatize, in, and I have issues with that too, because while I hear a lot of economists um, lauding it, I am concerned because privatization who is going to buy these assets anyway the port um, who will be in charge then who is going to privatize to the port the NPR stations um what, what else we privatize and I think Wasa is going that way as well and not only would it result in increased electricity where well, they are going to remove the subsidies totally and from the gas okay. um, higher prices and water but the poor people uh, yeah poor people are going to um, suffer. So who are buying these? Would well, the Trinidadians be given the opportunity, equal opportunity that is, to enjoy um, or to have a fair chance to purchase these assets? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Vigra. I was just going to ask to wrap up. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just moved on to the Q&A session where I asked everyone to um, raise questions and make comments and do some contributions. They must be short, please, no longer than two or three minutes. We have to deal with our time schedule. All the speakers would be given three to, or four minutes at the end of this meeting to respond to your active participation. You can also participate by writing in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, which will be seen by everyone. Please identify, identify yourself by name and your country. We would like to identify everyone by name for recording purposes and for a demographic survey. If your name does not appear on your profile on your screen, please click the three dots in the blue box on the top right of your picture and type your name. This meeting is being recorded and would be uploaded later after editing on YouTube for posterity. This meeting is also being streamed live on the Facebook page of Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center on Bhakti TV and on the social media networks. Please, please show respect for others and their point of view. Only those speaking should unmute their microphone. So whom can I give the floor now? 
Aram Jagesa. Go ahead. Yeah, um, there is a factor that we uh, here in Canada anticipating, not uh, not happily, and I think will happen to Trinidad and Guyana and Suriname, which will be the lowering of demand for oil and the lowering of oil prices. We have already seen it here in Canada. Our oil, our Athabasca oil and um, tar sands project is, is toast. We can't make money with it, um, you know, with oil at forty dollars a barrel. So we have basically closed it down and we're not getting any revenue from that. And this, uh, the, the main factor we see going forward is that all the car manufacturers, all of them are saying that within the next 10 years, they're all switching to electric cars, not hybrid, all electric cars. And um, a good batch of them are saying that within the next five years, they will be going all electric. They stop making gasoline, uh, you know, powered cars. And since forty percent of the oil produced is used for making gasoline, it requires no um, degree in economics to see that uh, there will be a drop in demand for oil, right? Without because these electric cars are not using gasoline, and there will be a drop in oil prices. I don't think we can do anything about that. And in relationship to Trinidad, um, you know, what will happen is, you know, to the, um, you know, to the Indo group is what's going to happen to everybody else that um, uh, we expect shortages of food, we, we expect devaluation of the currency, um, and various other problems that are coming at a, a tremendous pace. That's in my side. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Legisa. Has anyone else a question, a comment? Yeah, let me see, can I? Yes, Mansra Adramfal, Trinidad and Tobago. I have a question for Dr. Sajiwan, but of course the other panelists could uh, compare what happens in their countries. In Trinidad and Tobago, the allocation for agriculture is 1.198 billion out of a budget of 49.7 billion. What impact will this have on agriculture and in particular on diversification of agriculture in Trinidad? Okay. Would you like to respond? Yeah, thank Okay, so thank you um, very much. So um, Dr. Rampasad also did raise that question and you, you saved me having to clarify because the budget, the, the allocation to, um, to agriculture is not $500 million. The allocation to agriculture has remained the same as it was last year, basically. It's about three quarter, um, a little bit less than three quarter of a billion dollars. The $500 million is a, a top up that was committed to by this government during the election campaign. They committed a $500 billion to start the process of diversification through agriculture. And you are very correct. And it is something that I have been lamenting now for over 20 years. Every year we talk about food security and the, the necessity of diversifying and, and, and growing the agriculture sector. However, when it comes down to the allocation, really, there is very little money put into agriculture to make it happen. And then I could speak to the entire slew of problems that the farmers face with respect to land tenure, um, access to, to financing, flooding, labor shortages, and all of these things have been with us for a very, very long time and, and very little has been done to, to solve it. The, 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 the reality is we need an agricultural plan that is new wave, that is, that, that is technology based and driven. We have a tiny country, small land space, and therefore we need to think about new forms of agriculture. And more importantly, we need to talk about Caribbean agriculture. And it has should be a, 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 a program and the three countries here are ideal, Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname. The, the second who has vast um, acreages of land in terms of being able to produce 
primary produce at volume, Trinidad has the uh, manufacturing capability, the industrial base, and we should be looking at joint projects that could bring all of these things together. So, so that is my response to the agriculture issue. And um, Dr. Rampasad raised the issue of, and on the issue of the shrinking demand for oil, and you are very correct. Unfortunately for Ghana and, and Suriname, they're entering the market at a time when this market, this, this industry is so mature and really fading away. And we are now going into the whole area of alternative and new forms of energy. However, it will continue, fossil fuel will continue to be very relevant and the primary source of energy for at least the next 10 to 15 years. And therefore Ghana and Suriname has that window ensure that it uses the money that it monetizes from this natural resource to build other sectors that when the resources are not there, they are not where Trinidad and Tobago is. We have failed tremendously in terms of using the largest from our oil and gas sector to meaningfully diversify our economy. The whole issue of diversification is something I've been speaking to and, and calling for for well over 20 years. I want to end by saying okay. the agriculture sector has not only been abandoned by this PNM government, it was also significantly abandoned when we had an Indo Caribbean government as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Indira. We have about uh, 19 minutes. Can I so I would suggest to have all the questions, comments, and, and, and contributions. And then at the end, we ask the speakers to respond to them. All right. So let's start. Uh, Mr. Williams. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Go ahead. Um, Keep it short. I will. I sure will. <laughs> Folks, uh, just this past Wednesday, I made a presentation to a bunch of chamber members in Tampa, Florida. And two things I want to share with you. The first one is... Do not forget the most pressing issue in the world today, and it's COVID. So you cannot be dreaming about all these plans if you don't take care of your people and make sure that we don't lose too many people from COVID. So we need some serious COVID focus and to ensure that our people all over, give them free masses, masks, give them whatever they need. But we need to keep them alive. And the historical data said all the cities that were taken care of, they grew back very quickly. Second point I want to tell you is that the, the borrowing of the world, I looked at all the world data and the borrowing is much higher for the developed countries. They, they know that borrowing is needed to get us out of COVID. So I, I applaud your countries. I love your countries. I've been to two out of three of them. And by the way, Dr. Idlera, I've been preaching diversity, diversification for umpteen years across the Caribbean, but we only seem to attack it when we have an emergency like now. And so please keep in mind, borrowing is not a bad thing, but you have to manage the borrowing. Okay. I, that, those are my points. Thank you, sure. Any other questions? We have seven minutes. My name is Mike, Mike Passard. I want to ask a question of the Surinam speaker. He said, uh, he talked about the high external debt of the Suriname economy, and it's not sustainable. And then he also talked about um, needing budgetary support from the IMF. I have a question. Why would they need budgetary support um, when Suriname is now becoming uh, what we call a rentier economy? You're getting basically free money from your oil, where is half a billion or a billion dollars a year, whatever it is, um, that, that is like half of your budget um, coming, from, coming from the heaven. Why would you still need um, budgetary support from the IMF? That's it, thank you. Okay, all right, so um, now I would like, I would like to, have a comment from Mr. Sat Sukdeo, Dr. Tarasin, Mr. Brian Ramfong, and Leon Brunings. Can we have a comment from you, please, or a question? Very short. Uh, yeah, this is Sat Sukdeo speaking. I think we have to be very careful in uh, looking at what's happening in this budget, because in the past, we had a lot of flowery promises and 
a lot of big words, but nothing came to pass. Right. And if we are to judge by what happened in the past, we have to realize that a lot of it could have just been propaganda, you know, just trying to just trying to smooth over things with the public. So I would say that I would be very cautious, very careful, and look to see how much is actually done because what I have seen in Trinidad is there has been a gross neglect of the basics, such as roads and water and uh, such things like flood control and all that has been continuing for the past four or five years, although you've been hearing a lot of fantastic speeches on these issues. So okay. I would be very cautious. So I would say I would look to see what's really happening on the ground, the reality, rather than the rhetoric. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Dr. Uh, Tarasi, do you have a small contribution for us, for the oh, speakers? I, OK. <clears throat> Good night. Um, my question is directed to Dr. David Prashad of Suriname. He painted a very grim picture of um, Trinidad with death and I want to ask him, was this situation caused by the current administration or from the previous uh, administration? And um, he, his, his delivery was not optimistic at all, as somebody pointed out, given the fact that they will soon enjoy oil wealth. Um, so I'd like him to comment on that. Um, why is he that pessimistic about uh, I mean, many countries have taken the IMF, although they impose stringent measures, they will still get out of it, um, given the fact that he will get a major source of revenue from oil. So if you can comment on that for me, um, I'll appreciate. Okay, thank you. Is it Brian Ramfall? No, he spoke already. So uh, Leon, Leon, Leon. Okay, Leon, Leon Brunings. Yes, and uh, also a question for uh, my countrymen. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things which is really hampering the 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 the, the Suriname economy is its large uh, core of um, of civil servants. And uh, you know, I was uh, I haven't really seen uh, good programs to see how we are going to curtail that because in addition to the big uh, debt. We are, of course, faced with this huge uh, army of civil servants, which we st still have to pay. And I, you know, I have to mention that the past uh, administration, uh, even when they knew that they lost the elections, they still hired a lot of people um, and, and, and that added to the budget. So I'm uh, really wondering how we're going to curtail that problem. I think that's going to be one of the other big challenges of the Suriname government. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have, um, can we have a comment from Salauddin and Charlene Maharaj? Hi, Kriti. Good evening, everyone. I see you asked for somebody else before me, right? So yeah. I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait. No, I would, I'm not sure if the person is in. Um, Dr. Kumar, do you, yes. see, do you see Salauddin? Uh, yes, let me um, check here. Yeah, yeah, Salim, Salim, are you there or you have left? Maybe um, he is, his image is there, but... Okay, maybe we can give Salim yeah. Maharaj the floor. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Miss Salim, please. Yes. Thanks, Kirti. You're doing an excellent job, by the way. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I just want to make a couple of comments on... Um, some points Indira Rampasad spoke to, and that is the airport project in Tobago. I have a little, little bit of experience in airline and aviation, and I am, I am pretty concerned about the expenditure there. We are well aware that travel within the Caribbean and two Caribbean islands tend to be very expensive when compared to traveling to international countries, whether it's the US, Miami, and so forth. A huge part of that cost is taken up by taxes, and those include airport taxes, passenger fees, that sort of thing. And we have done some work and found that they range somewhere in the average of 40% of the taxes that you pay for travel intra-Caribbean. When we put down these, these structures, 
with all the adequate demand analysis associated with the type of travel that we anticipate, whether it's business travel or tourist travel, we end up with almost a white elephant where the, the burden of the taxes fall twice on the taxpayers. One, paying back the loans for the, the structure. And secondly, it, the taxes that are imposed on the traveler. Mm -hmm. And since the Trinidadians account for the major proportion of travel to Tobago, given the decline in tourism, are we as Trinidadians going to bear the brunt of those taxes? should the demand not materialize as Albert had spoken to with respect to where we are in COVID. The second part of that I want to raise is intergenerational wealth, which is part of the culture, the Indo culture. As far as I understand, and I can be corrected, the lands that are being taken to extend the airport are freehold land, and people are being moved to leasehold lands. Any one of us, if they someone were to take away our property and put us on a leasehold property, what would we be feeling? And I really think as an Indo-Caribbean group, where part of our culture is the passing on of wealth via land, we should stand up and speak out against something like this on behalf of our Tobagonian brothers. I'm very, very concerned about that. And and I have other things to make on that, uh, what I would consider the cartelization of our country, the oligopolization of our country with this budget, but I'll hold on that for now, Kumar and Tuti. Okay, 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 thank you. Um, I want to ask Brian Rampal to ask a question, but please keep it short, less than a minute because we're running out of time and I want to close the session at 10 local time. Mr. Brian Rampal, are you there? Mr. Brian Rampal, last call. Okay, so he's not there. Let's then move to the speakers. Speakers, you have three minutes to respond to the questions, the comments, and please stay within the time limit. Dr. Indira, would you like to start? Well, since you started with me, maybe it would have been better if you ended with me. Um, <laughs> but my mic is already off. Um, you know, I mean, there, there really isn't any questions to respond to because I, I think I did already. But to say that I agree with Charlene in terms of we are at a critical juncture in the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. There really is an absence of a very clear, defined pathway to this whole notion of an economy beyond oil and gas. We are examining the, the budget 2021 in a COVID environment, and we're all very, very cognizant of the challenges of COVID. And Albert, you are correct. The issue of saving lives and livelihoods is, is, is critical, but also there are protocols that can be followed very safely to, to, to start the process of reopening and getting back to to, to live in and getting back economic activity happening. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we seem to be managing from a position of fear. And we are doing so to the detriment of the economy. Only today on a newspaper, we heard where one of our very large business entity in Chaguanas is closing down permanently. And that's a frightening thing because the implication for that is loss of jobs, um, loss of economic activity. And we are uh, were told only yesterday that you know we will be caring again on the 24th of October what's going to be happening next. Whereas countries around us are putting in protocols in place, reopening their, their reopening their borders, allowing flights to come in, allowing tourists to come in with proper COVID and health protocols in place to manage the process. So budget 2021, there's a lot of good talk, but talk is cheap. And it is only in implementation that any of it um, really can translate into anything good. And from the evidence, from the years and years of tracking budgets, I can't say that I am very hopeful that it will translate into much good because we do suffer a significant implementation deficit in this country. We, we talk a good talk at, at times like this in order to really to pacify persons. However, at the end of the day, implementation really gets cut short. So with respect to the large infrastructural projects, we are hearing them over and over. In fact, the, this particular government for the last five years spoke to the airport, spoke to the Toko port, spoke to the highway to Toko, and 
just as Charlene dissected the issue of the airport, I can uh, as well dissect the issue of, of, of spending money to establish a TOCO port. Yes, we'll generate employment during construction, short-term employment, but where, where's the economics to, de to determine that this is a feasible project going forward? Uh, a person's going to divert containers into the Toko area, hardly likely. Yachts are not going to go there. There's a plan for a marina, but those waters are choppy waters. And on the other hand, we have an en entire North Coast well suited to a yachting sector that government's policy is allowing to die. So there's a lot to be said, but I yes, I, I, I will wrap up to say that, yeah, we're talking about, on, on the whole, we're talking about the whole issue of budgets in the context of economic development and economic growth. And we want to remain optimistic because we would like to see good ideas translated into action. And I think there's a role here for an organization such as yours for the next year to identify the items in the respective budgets in each country and to spend time holding government to account and asking for constant updates in terms of where it is with respect to implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then we move on to uh, the second speaker, Mr. Tanwar Singh. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna offer a couple of comments quickly on some of the broad topics that were raised in the question. The first one is on the global demand for oil. Um, to the speaker who raised that question, there is no uncertainty about this. Global demand for oil is going to wean out. Um, the timeline, however, there are still some disagreements in the exact timeline. BP released a report a couple uh, weeks ago that says late 2020 oil peak, demand peak. OPEC came back with a re report a couple days after and said, no, it's going to go on for much longer. The point is, it's going to come. It's just a matter of time of when. U.S. and Canadian cities, I know for sure, because I do planning, economic planning for some U.S. cities and, and counties and, and states. They're already thinking about putting legislation and regulation in place to electrify their grids and allow for that massive influx of electric vehicles. So this is happening. And so yes, Guyana and Suriname are on the short end of the stick. They have a shorter window to, to use that resort. What they do with it is what will decide where they go and what their economies look like um, after th that oil demand has collapsed. Um, I, the, the issue of... Um, Agriculture in Trinidad, I can't help but to, to mention that I've been doing some research on this. And Trinidad, you guys have been talking about diversification since the 1970s. And there's an old saying, when the price of oil is high, there is no appetite for diversification. When the price of oil is low, there is no money to diversify. Diversification in Trinidad, as far as I know, the little that I know, you guys are going to have to think of a different model. And maybe one of that model is, as your speaker said, Guyana has land, you have capital. Suriname has land, you have capital. But that will require a change in attitude. This protectionist attitude Trinidad has with respect to agriculture produce from Guyana and, and even Suriname. So, but I think that's a model here going forward. COVID-19. We can't wait this out. No, no economy can wait this out. You're going to flatline your economy if you think you can wait this virus out. You have to find a balance of putting proper health uh, uh, procedures in place and allow the economy to still breathe. Or soon you're not gonna have an economy to talk about. So we gotta find that balance. Um, external debt. Even the chief economist of the world bank is on record saying two days ago, borrow, borrow if you have to, fight the crisis, save lives, we'll decide how to pay for it after. You you're a sovereign state. And I know this is not something you'll get from an economist in normal time. You can't necessarily go bankrupt as a sovereign state, but there is problems associated with printing and too, too uh, much of expansionary monetary policies. But in this time with a COVID virus, you have a lot more flexibility and global standards are going to change in what is considered to be acceptable or not. Lastly, I'll, I'll mention is this issue of budget. I agree with the speakers who said, look, we oftentimes hear governments talk about the billions that they're spending and they're spending. I am one of those persons who have been arguing that we cannot measure progress by how much we spend. We have to measure progress on what we get for those spending. What are the results? How much was actually implemented and what did we get for them? What did taxpayers get in return for the taxes that we're spending inside of these priorities? So let's focus on the outcome and the output. Lastly, civil ah. servant size. <laughs> civil servant size in Guyana is the same issue. But ironically in the COVID situation, the question here is timing. You want a, a small civil service, yes, as possible, but at a time when the economy is so 
uh, uh, tank and activities are, are, are so tight. Is this really the period where you want to down, where you want to shrink that, that, that workforce? Maybe you want to delay it a little bit. But that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, Mr. Dharaj. Okay, then uh, we give the floor to my colleague, my wonderful colleague, Stephen. The floor is yours. Please stay within your time limit. Three minutes. Okay, thank you, Kirti. Um, I'll start with the questions of uh, Mr. Brunet. Um, he um, began with um, uh, budget support from the IMF. Well, the interesting thing is, indeed, we have uh, good things uh, coming up, good things uh, in, uh, uh, on the horizon, but those good things aren't here yet. For the moment, we can't make our own, we can't uh, pay our own bills. We can't uh, make the expenses, um, which, are, which have to do with uh, uh, foreign borrowing. Um, so, like I said, we are constantly at the brink of a default, and we have we have been defaulted um, at the so, somewhere in 2020. So this could happen again in October because we have to pay uh, a coupon payment of $28 million, and then again in, in December. So for the moment, we don't have that amount of money. Uh, we, we just have uh, enough money to pay up civil servants. That brings up, that brings me to this, your second question. But firstly, um, just to satisfy the, the foreign borrowers, we have to uh, work with the IMF. It, get, it gets us, it backs our reputation, but IMF stands for a structured economy. IMF stands for uh, structured expenses, which um, are in line, which are income. Um, so it's not just for the image, it's also because um, we have to do this. We were at the doorstep of IMF in 2016, then we stopped certain, uh, at, at a certain moment. Um, there is work uh, needed to restructure our economy, and one of those parts has to do with civil servants. Civil servants are the elephant in the room, never addressed by any po political party. Even the, the one setting, I don't see any mention of it in their budget. Although when, when they were campaigning, they had a lot of a lot to say about civil servants for the other uh, viewers. Um, Sixty percent of the workforce in Suriname um, is uh, um, and directly or indirectly involved in the public sector. So that's a huge number. It's a um, it's a part of the of the workforce that we need for the for the particular sector. We need them for innovation. So and also that diversification. So yes, we um, we have good things coming up for us, but that will, will not happen in 2020, not in 2021. Maybe later on, and then we have the problem with, with peak oil that maybe what we see in, in oil developments will not pay off as much as, uh, as we think. But for the moment, we have to behave. We have to get our uh, we get, have to do our homework, and that starts with uh, going to the IMF. Um, Mr. Tarasing. Um, his question had to do uh, with the bleak situation we're in, and definitely uh, the bleak situation was caused by the previous government, the Bautista government. Um, when he came into power in 2010, uh, we had an economic growth of uh, 3%, around 3%. Suriname had good perspectives at that, at that time. We had a debt on, uh, way under 40% of GDP, which is now sur surpassed uh, 100%. Um, and in, 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 this, the, 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 the ironically, uh, popular measures which came into uh, place in 2010 were implemented just to raise the living standard for the common Surinamese. But at the end of the day, now in 2020, we see that we have a lot, a lot of purchasing power because of the previous uh, popular measures. That's why I called it populism as the same thing, what happened in Brazil, but mostly in Venezuela and in Argentina. Um, it was mentioned before, yeah, the, the, the last yes. thing, the, the COVID fund and the, the focus on COVID, indeed, we have to focus on human lives, but do not forget the sectors which, have, which, have, which are hard hit by COVID. Uh, the governments must trigger these uh, and support these sectors, because if you leave it like that, even continuing in 2021, um, it will definitely keep on hurting your economy and the recession most of the world is in will keep on continuing in 2021. So um, it, it will pay off at, uh, eventually. So, so monetary financing at the moment is not such a bad deal, especially if you allocate it toward uh, stimulating the sectors which are hard hit by COVID. 
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. I've noticed that we have some questions in the chat box, but unfortunately, we do not have the time to address those. So this brings me to the end of this presentation of this meeting. I want to hand over to Dr. Kumar. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirti Agu. For, uh, oh, you want to make a, a short comment? Sorry. We, we, you had problems. This is Indira. We had problem with your audio. I think that's why she skipped you, but let's try it again. Okay, I'm, I'm on. Um, yeah, I just want to yeah. say that I think that the biggest problem with COVID-19, apart from the health problem, is the in inequities that it has actually triggered. And um, I don't know if the budget has, I don't think the budgets have addressed those inequities. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, I spoke about the privatization and who is going to benefit. We hear a lot of talk here about a 1% benefiting. We have kids, um, students, and I'm particularly concerned as an educator myself, who don't have any means of getting online. They don't have connectivity or they don't have a device. And I know of children in rural areas. Um, currently, the government has proposed um, a number of laptops with, with a budget, but about, about 48,000 students are still going to be left without, um, unless they have one of their own. And keep in mind, we may have three and four children in one home, which may not have three and four laptops, and all of them online at the same time. So um, we have to look at the inequities, the property tax, those who can afford to pay, uh, but those Ramata, who can't. Audio, audio the audio is very bad. Can you uh, hold up? Because we, <laughs> okay, sure. It's an effort to hear. All right, no problem. I'm, I'm holding up. Thank you. Okay. All right, sorry we couldn't um, see you and also hear you clearly. So this brings us to the end of our public meeting tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirti Algu from Srinam for being an excellent moderator. We'd love to have you again. It's the first time we have someone with the doctorate in the social <laughs> sciences who is a moderator. So thank you again. <laughs> And thanks for, to all the participants who have taken the time to join us tonight and made this sacrifice. This, we had a small turnout tonight because it's about budget. Not many people are interested in budget and economics and so on. We usually have about, we sometimes have about 90 participants who want this about raw politics. Um, thanks especially to the presenters. Um, Thanks to the advisory and planning team behind me. This is a team effort directed by people in the Indian diaspora. Dr. Betoram Ramharak, who couldn't be with us because tonight he's celebrating his birthday in New York. Vishnu Bistram, also from New York, had some other commitment. Brian Ramfall is there. We called upon him, but for some reason he, he didn't talk. Cliff Rajkumar from Canada. Ravi Dev from Guyana, again, who couldn't be with us. Satsukde, who is here, Leon Brunnings, always glad to have you, very helpful in, in, in helping me get a panel together, especially some, a speaker from Suriname, and many, many others. You know, I've always been forgetting to thank Dino, the IT guy who is behind the scene. He is a gatekeeper, admitting you, putting you out when you misbehave and so on, and doing all the recordings. So Dino... Thank you and my apology for never giving you credit before. As I've said before, this is a public meeting being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. We are a publishing company. If you have books to publish, magazines and reports, please uh, feel free to contact us. This meeting is held every Sunday night at this time, that's Trinidad Atlantic time, on a variety of topics that are of interest to a number of people Feel free to suggest a topic. Feel free to volunteer as a presenter or discussant. We are all volunteering. You can also organize an entire panel. This platform is yours as well as ours. If you do not hear from us, um, uh, if we forget by, for some reason to invite you, you can just go to our Facebook page, Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center Company Limited. You do not need a a Zoom link or user ID or password. Um, so there are many people looking at us tonight who is not on our screen because they are accessing us through Facebook and other 
media networks through which we are streaming live. Um, our next topic, tentative topic for next Sunday, is a popular one, and we should probably reach the 90 or so participants that we often get. It's a lecture illustrated by a film, a lecture by Dr. Linda Anush, who is a US scholar, and she's going to talk about and show a film on the Indian influence on the Rastafari, on Rastafarism in Jamaica. So that should be very interesting. So next Sunday night, make sure you log on. Um, thanks very much to all of you again, ladies and gentlemen, be safe and enjoy the rest of the day or night, depending on your time. This is not the end of this discussion because we write an article on the discussion tonight and we, we, uh, we, we upload this uh, discussion to, uh, to YouTube and on Facebook, we share it. So this is not the end. M uh, many, many more people will see what we have talked about tonight. So thank you very much again, and may God bless you all. Good night, or good morning, or good evening. Bye. Thank you, sir. Okay. 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 Okay.